Alex and Tina. Hi, Hi Jennifer. We're so happy to be talking to you. Both of y'all's hair is like giving me hair goals. There's like a part. You're, like that's... you're the one to talk. Yeah, you have no the kidding. most iconic hair. I mean, I haven't seen you in years, but yeah. I will never, I have not like never forgotten your voluminous. <laughs> same. And I've, I met hair. you once in an audition yeah. and I remember thinking, wow, she's got great hair. Well, same. I'm like having part envy from the two of you, like the down centered. We part. do love a middle part. We really have been rocking the middle part. <laughs> I, recently. That was like an old thing in middle school for me, honestly. And I feel like I, I, when I try it, I don't look like myself, but I know that I need to upgrade my look and like the side part thing. I don't know what's going on. Well, they say that like millennials, you can tell a millennial if they've got a side part. So I think all of us millennials are trying the middle part to. But I will tell you, because I'm also a curly girl. My hair's straight right now. But when I'm curly, the middle part looks heinous. That's what I'm saying. Because you look, it's like a poodle moment. You can't not poodle. It's yeah. terrible. So if you're ever going to blow your hair out or something, then you can try the middle. Mm-hmm. But no, with your curly hair, you got to yeah. roll with it. Yeah. Good. Side. At least I have the stamp of approval from both of you because I feel like if anyone's going to know how this works, it would be the two of you. <laughs> <laughs> we try. It's amazing. Um, I'm so excited that you're here and that I'm here and we're both in two places, I guess, because this will be appearing or sounding, I guess, on two different spaces. Yes. Yeah. On both of our channels. This is so yeah. fun. And we've been a fan of your podcast for a while. You've had some of our favorite people on. Shout out Shawnee and Brooke Shapiro. Yes. yes. So, I mean, we, you know, you're doing a great job I mean, there. y'all are like seasoned vets on this. So on my end, I'm like envious of how many A seasons you've been through and how many incredible guests you've had because you've certainly topped the amount that I've had, but also just like the breadth of people that you've had on has just been outrageous. So I'm so pumped that you're here. Thank you. We're so, so pumped fun. to be here. Um, I mean, for all of our listeners, let's do some like go arounds of who we are today. I Tina? love that. I love the who we are today because I, you know, I'm sure you hear this all the time, but as artists, we're like wearing all these hats and I always have my like top three, yeah. but they, they all shift, like which one I decide to pick first. Yeah. So today I am a podcast host, a singer, musician, and a makeup artist and an actor. I think those are my my things today. Yes. In no particular yeah. order. I just I'm here no. for it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Today, actress, model, fit model, podcast host. And this is an interesting, like little weird thing. We have not talked about this, but Tina and I had very different lockdown pandemic experiences. She like really leaned into music and she was singing every day and mm-hmm. she was playing guitar. I f- it singing made me sad during the pandemic, Mm -hmm. I went the opposite way and I like didn't want anything to do with it. And I don't really know why I felt like that. So anyway, but a really good friend of mine said to me, called me out and was like, Alex, you have not been singing recently. Like what's up? So anyway, I'm going to say singer because I am implementing 2023 to just like sing for fun now because I don't feel sad about it anymore. I went through a weird phase. I don't feel sad about it anymore, but I need to just like bring it back into my life. I love that. that. I I relate very deeply. I feel like I didn't, I didn't do any of the performing things at all in the pandemic. I was coaching all of the things and I wasn't doing it myself. And I, it's so weird that you're talking about that because I literally had a conversation with a friend the other day about like my voice and using my voice, whether it is through art or whether it is just expression and how there was this weird moment in the pandemic where it's like my identity in relationship to my voice is, I, I don't know, it's like this, it's been this weird migratory, anyway, I'm feeling a huge kinship towards that. So good on you for yeah, owning it. So- Right. Yeah. It made me sad for whatever reason. I don't know if it's because I thought of it like it's like a fun group thing yeah. and the group things were done. I'm not sure. But anyway, those days are done. It's a new day. So who are <laughs> you today? I'm very oh, interested. Who am I today? I am first and foremost a doggy mommy to my dog, Walter. I will always be that first and foremost. He is the love of my life. Um, I am an actor. I am also a singer. I am a podcast host. Here she sits. I am a collaborator. I am a an ideas person. I am currently really trying to continue writing more. That has been a very begrudging, hard situation, but I'm really trying to continue leaning into that label. 
and I am a coach. Um, that has probably been the the main source of a lot of my, um, I don't know, artistic fulfillment recently, especially now because we are in, um, I mean, we're always in audition season, but we've just been in the mix of a lot of MFA, BFA um, auditions. And that's usually when the flux of people come knocking on my door. Mm -hmm. It's been really rewarding to assist these incredible artists with um, telling their truth and storytelling. Good for you. Thank you. That's so really cool. cool. Are you coaching through your own studio? Are yeah. you with the studio? Yeah, I have a couple. So I do – I'm on the roster of a couple of different places, but primarily it's my own. Um, I should, frankly, be better at promoting myself and marketing myself. That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but I've been doing it for years at this point, and it's pretty much word of mouth. Um, I do this one thing called monologue sourcing where I find monologues specifically for people. But that came out as like a byproduct from the coaching that I do more specifically for BFA and MFA coaching as all these people needed material. Um, but no, people, it's really acting the song, scene study, Shakespeare. Um, and then I'd say I also teach at different universities. Um, now it's getting back into in-person, but over the pandemic, it was all virtual. And I teach master classes and workshops in that capacity as well. So it's been really awesome. That's, that's really so cool. cool. I didn't realize you were doing yeah, that. Yeah, that's. I mean, I did, recently. I mean, I realized recently, but I didn't. You know, no, but it's true. I years. don't talk about it. I get like really weird and and like I don't. I, that's my own imposter syndrome about it. Even though I'm fucking great at it. <laughs> if I we if all, I, well, yeah. You know. I mean, if we all had our personal little pocket PR person, life would uh -huh. be. It's it's hard. It's hard pocket to promote yourself. PR. That it would be a great. Yo, thing to market. it would be. <laughs> Yo, I think you need to market that. PR. Wait, yeah. <laughs> Actually, you're kind of my pocket PR person. <laughs> I do. I'm always well, like, hey, Alex, what do I do about this? Blah, 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 blah. It's so easy to, like, would you believe in someone, a friend or yeah. something, to just blast them all over? Yeah. But there's a little piece that, so, oh my God, I have the easiest time with Tina. It's very clear to me. Yeah. I like can't wait to share. But when it's you, there's just this little yeah. part of you that feels a little gross sometimes. I know. Yeah. All of us. But why is that? I think about it, you know, from like, there's so many like lenses of it. It's the female aspect of it for sure of we've been taught to stay small or the world society has like been like stay in your place. So I think there's maybe a little inkling of that. But it's also as artists, you know, it's like to take up space. That's a whole other thing too. And so I, I imagine they're both intertwined for me. I also wonder if it's like a generational thing mm. too, you know, because I, I look at the younger generation now and they they – don't seem to have any problem taking up yeah. space, you know? And I, I think like our generation and the generations before us, there is sort of a, a expectation to be smaller. Mm. I think. I don't know. Do you feel, I, did you feel that growing up for yourself? Oh, absolutely. It was like me. And I grew up as a five, nine. I'm, I'm five, nine. I didn't grow up as a five, nine. Person. <laughs> you popped but out I'm, of the womb. You were five, nine, ready to go. <laughs> gigantic. No, but I was always the tallest girl in the class. My, my mom and my sister are tall. My dad's tall. And it was always make yourself smaller, be shorter, except for if you're going to play volleyball, then, then be tall and that's great, but don't wear heels. Don't make a scene. Don't draw attention. Mm. Um, because it's unattractive and not ladylike, you know, I think, aren't you tall too? Aren't you around our height? It's funny. It's funny because I think myself included, I, I think I show up taking up a lot of space. I'm technically five, six, like I'm not, <gasps> In my mind, the huge hair yeah. too adds. I maybe, but I I do think I'm like a five six who's like masking as a five eight. Well, I feel yeah, in my body like I'm five eight. Thank you. Yeah, that's so funny. Well, I, I was telling Tina a little bit before we got on about how you and I met, and yeah. we were do. It was like this year of different readings and concerts of yeah. this musical, Factory Girls. And I was explaining to her, there are like the pretty, cute girls, and there's like the tough girls, and they're called like the rusty girls. And so I just remember a lot of like belting next to each other, and our yeah. big hair. I had my hair curly. You <laughs> yeah. had your hair curly. Our hair were like touching each hairs. other. Also, <laughs> like we just have darker features. Yes. Tended to be the like harder girls, and it was like, what yes, about it that? Was <laughs> Like, Tina, like no, yeah, no matter what, you would have been as whatever the other softer people. I would have been like, on the other side of yeah, the stage. Yes, no matter yes, whether yes. you were that or not, you just would have been because you're blonde. 
Right, yes, right. It was so oh, – it was so funny. But, yeah, we both definitely, I think, grew up – we bonded over just being tall. And I got – I'm 5'8". I'm a little shorter than Tina. But, like, I was 5'8 in sixth grade. Wow. So, like, it, I – we grew early. And I felt like a giant ogre giant, you know? Mm-hmm. And now I love it. But when you're 12, yeah. you do not want to stand out. You don't yeah. want right. to – you know what I mean? Yeah. Also, back to the self-promotion and social media conversation, I recently was talking to a friend of mine who has more of a corporate job. And so on that end, people in those businesses, they use their Instagram like truly personal. I like, know. this is my cat. This is what. And so they don't understand. You know, she was kind of like, why are actors like always posting themselves, like singing oh, or monologue? And I was like, okay, so number one, maybe their manager told them or a casting director told them that they have to use Instagram as a business tool. Because yeah. when you go in for audition, a lot of times people are looking at your Instagram. Like I was explaining to her how for us, it's a business tool. And, you know, if we don't post about our podcast, who's going to know? We don't yeah. have a professional, you know, yeah. like, you're, you know, so, so I think there's that piece of it too. It's like different businesses might not understand how we're using it and like we might feel that. So it's, it's complicated. Yeah. It's, it's this weird thing though. I mean like this touchy, I feel very, I don't know. I have a lot of feelings about social media that I've talked about in different episodes. I certainly talk about it with my friends about this love hate relationship and that if in my like mind's eye, all I really want to post are photos of me hiking on a mountain and like snuggling my dog, you know? And because mm-hmm. of what we do, there is there is this expectation that, oh, right, I need to like show up as this artist person. And also, as you're saying, like if you have a project that you're working on or if there's this consistent resource, which is this podcast that we want to share, it's like what other way to do it than on your social media? But it's like it doesn't hold the same space. It's a very, it's a complicated relationship, but very lovely. Oh, it totally it's is. It's really complicated. And I think for all of us in the same business, when I see someone posting their show, their podcast, their singing or dancing reel, I'm like, good for you, girl. Mm-hmm. I know what you're doing. It's like, yeah. good for you. We're all in this together. Do what you yeah. got to do. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, I'm curious for both of you, obviously, you know, like you've been doing this podcast for a bit and both of you have such varied, diversified artistic hats, careers, like where, how are you feeling thus far in these aspects of your life? Like, are you feeling that they're all, like all these hats are even and you're taking them on and off at the same rate? Are you feeling like some of them really occupy more time, whether you want it or not? Like, how do you feel like you use these in your life? We talk about, it's such a good question. We talk about this a lot and we talk about how you cannot do every single thing you're good at and every single thing you're passionate about in the same day. So like between seasons, we take a big break, Mm -hmm. like a big old break. We took a extra long break this time because we were focusing on on other jobs. Mm -hmm. Tina has a solo show that she was like, and it's kind of in, chunks. Like you can't do everything at the same time. What do you think about that? Well, no, and I I totally agree. And I think that naturally the universe sort of does a little bit of the work for us. It ebbs and flows with opportunities. So like right now, my two hats, I'm gearing up to leave town for three weeks to perform. So I'm like in complete and total rehearsal mode and podcast mode. And I just haven't had that many makeup jobs come up, which Mm -hmm. is great because I need that time to rehearse. And normally I'm working two or three gigs a day and I have no time to eat, sleep or breathe or do anything and squeezing it. But so I think the the universe kind of naturally does it. So sometimes I feel like more of a makeup artist. Sometimes Mm -hmm. I feel more of an art, like a musician. Sometimes I feel more of a podcast host. Um, And I said this to Alex yesterday. I I was like, I, I feel like I have like 70 browser tabs open Mm. in my head and also like my Sonos is playing in the background (sighs) of those tabs. So like my brain is like right now, I'm not juggling. I mean, I think I actually am juggling it okay. Yeah. But it's hard. You're in a particularly intense time right at this moment with a bunch of shows coming up and our season right now. But also we know that it ebbs and flows. Yeah. It it is. And that's the crazy thing about this business is there are weeks or months where you feel everything is so intense and you feel pulled in so many different directions. And then there's a month where things are so slow and you wish you had the busy month or whatever. But I'm interested in how you kind of differentiate in your head or like break up time or your answer would be to that. 
it's a hard one. I feel like it's something that I'm it will be like the thing I grapple with, I think, for the rest of my life, honestly, for better or for worse. Like I, you know, I think about like the seasons of one's life, right? How one goes through many different seasons um, of growth, of curiosity, of development, of interest, of passion. Um, and with all these different seasons, I think these various hats, for example, are taken on, taken off. I think back in the day, I really tried to compartmentalize them a lot more. I was like, oh, I am performing at this moment. Oh, I am teaching at this moment. And as I've, I think really more post-pandemic, as I've gotten older, I'm more cognizant of the fact that all of these things really interplay and not trying to um, A, label myself so explicitly while I'm doing the thing, but B, um, allow myself to use different parts of these different hats or identities while I'm doing the thing that I'm doing. Um, so really trying to integrate, I'd say, as much as possible, um, which I know isn't really answering the question, but it's like, it keeps me like not feeling bad when I'm not able to do the thing that I really want to do, which is often. That, that go ahead. <laughs> I just say that makes total total sense. And you know, I think sometimes when we try and compartmentalize too much, I find this anyway. It it's way more exhausting. Yeah. When I first moved to the city and was doing all of my support jobs, and I was catering and babysitting and you know selling my soul to make a buck, mm -hmm. and then like I'd go and I'd have the one day that I got to sing. Yeah. It would just everything revolved around the, around that, and I'd be exhausted by the time I got to it. Now all of my jobs sort of have to do with the other mm. somehow. I'm, I'm in the same world. The people that I'm around are the same. It's the same kind of people. And I'm really, I, that's why I got into the business in the first place was for this community. And so to have all of my jobs sort of have to do with that, they do feed each other and it allows for the other to grow and have space while the other one might, you know, grow in a different direction. Yeah, they really do. And I think that the ability to realize that and recognize that definitely just comes with age because I think, you know, like what you were saying, Jennifer, about seasons, like I kind of think of it as chapters. Like there's these chapters where you're doing this because I had a chapter about a year and a half, two years where I was only, I was producing okay. and I was working as a makeup artist for commercials not like all over the country, flying around for, oh, Merrill Lynch, wow. uh, Wells Fargo, like these, ra and it, that's what I was doing. And, and this was a, a little bit ago. And so f I remember that anxiety of like, well, that means I'm never going to be the creative one again, or I'm never going to be an actress again. Yeah. Or I'm not And now I kind of know the ebbs and flows and the chapters and the seasons and things come and go. And I'm grateful for that period because I learned a lot. Yeah. And But it doesn't mean that that was my forever and ever and ever. I kind of circled back around to other things. How do you gauge that in terms of like your expectations that you had on yourself, right? Like if you, if you envisioned your life you know, going a certain way or like a certain part of your career or a certain part of one of these identities reaching a certain milestone by perhaps a certain point, how do you clock that progress for yourself? Or how do you start to feel okay about the fact that perhaps something has to take a back seat while the other thing takes the front seat? It's really hard. I mean, it's really hard. It yeah. takes a lot of, I think, self-reflection and work and a lot of uh, awareness of of yourself. and. There's this woman that I, I follow that I love. My mom actually reads her like forecast every day. Her name's Elizabeth Peru, mm -hmm. and she reads the moon and the signs of the sun and astrology, and she's really very smart. And she, you know, as the new year was approaching, she was talking about how um, these new moons were happen happening and Jupiter is like all these things that I am not going <laughs> to relay correctly, but she was saying that you know, the, this upcoming year, all of the things that we set into motion in 2011, this year are when those things are going to start coming back and they're oh. going to start, we're going to start seeing the, the like fruits of those labors, the, the flowers of those seeds kind of come back, things that we sort of started and planted in 2011. Well, I, I think we're all around the same age here. I was graduating college the year before. 2011 was a very tumultuous year for me. Um, and I remember telling my mom, 
what a cool thing because I sort of felt like I went on this direction that I'm sad that I went on. Mm -hmm. And I thought that my, my career as a performer was not going to be successful because I decided to go one way instead of another. And now I'm like, oh, I, I, cause I really did approach my thirties and I was like, well, I'm not, I'm never going to be in another show ever again. Right. It's just not in the cards for me. And the pandemic happened. Um, you know, all these things happened and suddenly I am have more performance work than I've ever had in the nine years that I've been in New York City. Nice. So I think it's like being open to the universe, being open to looking back at your past. And also, like Alex said, like, be aware that like these are cycles of life and they nothing's ever done. And especially for women, I mean, I know this is something I fight against all the time. We all do, but you mentioned, okay, I hit 30 and it's like, we put these ages on yeah. ourselves. Okay. By this age, I'm doing this by the, and no one does that to us. Really, I mean, sure. Maybe society and women age, but like we, a lot of times it's our internal monologue of like, well, if something hasn't happened by this age. So I find myself really looking to women and looking up to women where they accomplish this one goal later or they accomplish something at 40. Like I always try to bring myself back to earth and back down to ground myself with those reminders. Yeah. I think about like, I mean, you're just listening to you speak. I, I like where we get those expectations from, <laughs> you know, it's just like, yeah. was it I, like in my mind, it really has to be a societal pressure subconsciously or consciously just from like the messaging that we're receiving. I think nowadays they're with social media being so prevalent and the way in which we're able to curate our little bubbles of what we're receiving for better or for worse. It's possible that you actually may be receiving quote unquote better or different messaging that isn't setting you up for these aged marking, you know, ex expectations. But I know for myself, just like even looking back on my life and looking up to different people that were role models or even um, things that I read or surrounded myself with, I I definitely felt that there was messaging told to me that if I didn't like achieve X by a certain point, then my worth is not what my worth is just inherently by being a human being. You know, I think that that really was something that I received and frankly have like worked a lot on in therapy to rewire of my own self-worth regardless of what's going on in my life or my achievements. Um, but it's hard to separate those things when you're when you're receiving all these messages around you. Especially things that you received when you were younger. So yeah. I have kind of a funny story. Right. So I can't remember which one, but one of the Broad City gals, and I cannot remember which one. I'm so sorry. Right. She has this theory that she shared on Armchair Expert that the movie My Best Friend's Wedding ruined millennial women. And here's why. It's okay. so about – she's 28. She's 28. She's 28. Oh my God. They like hammer it home. And so she's 28. She's a food critic, revered at the New York Times. The opening scene is the whole restaurant is like quivering in their boots. They're all nervous. She's there. Oh, my God. It's her. She's 20. And it's like at 28, first of all, you don't have that job. No. Where everyone is chance. scared of you. As a no, woman? Everyone, how many years ago? In New York City. No, like, I'm sorry. You're still at the shitty job, whatever. No, you're yeah. still full throttle in your 20s. So first of all, it told us that by 28, we are at the top of our field. We are the boss. Everyone is terrified of us that we are making so much money. Then they have a pact together, her and her best friend, that if they aren't married by the time they're 28, they marry each other, which tells us, well, if it doesn't happen by 28, it's yeah, all you're over. a dried up I old maid. I got this theory. I mean, it's such a Wait, small Wait, that is actually like, so. It's true so true we all watch that movie yeah. as children and yeah. they hammer home her age constantly yeah. you know they I think of 28 it. and I'm like oh my god that is just like <laughs> bless, a newborn baby yeah bless the souls like yeah truly. bless them oh my god yeah. 28 I mean I thought it was brilliant I yeah. thought I was like yes well now in my brain right. I'm also going through the Rolodex like isn't like knocked up wasn't she also like 30 explicitly 30 I want to say like she was like 
early 30s or like they explicit gave a like there's that number there's also the one that she same Catherine Heigl I guess she's like marking all these age things I think the one that she was like wearing a thousand different bridesmaids dresses I could swear she was a oh, number yeah. that they gave yeah 28 dresses or 20 yeah and then there was yeah. also 13 going on 30 like we're talking uh-huh. about like a real explicit number that like we never mention an age beyond 30 now that I'm right. now that we're talking about this I don't this is not a research project I've ever done but now I want to no. know It's true because I was, I talk about this a lot with the photographers that I work with, um, when we're doing headshots, it's, everyone knows who the ingenue is. Everyone knows who the high school love interest is. Everyone knows who the 20 something lovebirds are. And then if you're in your thirties, it's like, you just don't exist. It's Mm. an erased era, like a whole decade. And I watched this interview with Meryl Streep the other day. And she was like, I was feeling great. I was at the top of my game. I had all these wonderful roles. And the day I turned, like she was the year I turned 40, I got three offers to play witches. (laughs) 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 So like in one year, it was like suddenly I went from the love interest to just now you're just an old hat. I love with like a wart on your face. I love her. That's a dream, like, honestly. Just Somebody 40. just was like, here, play a witch for the rest of time. Okay. Yeah. I mean, honestly, like, I'd love to play a witch. But it's Same. true. I mean, you go. But that's that's hilarious. That's, and I, yeah. I will say this is, I think I'm going to throw a positive out there about social media because you can find people. So three people I follow are Melissa Wood. She has this amazing yoga Pilates mm-hmm. business. She has an amazing app. It's $9.99 a month. She's, I love her. She talks about a lot. She had her, her kids in her mid-30s. And 34, 35. And she was like, I was still a little, what am I doing? I'm not ready for kids. Her business really didn't boom until after she had kids. And I also, um, I really look up to Molly Sims. She, I mean, had a crazy modeling career, but she didn't get married or have her kids. So she was 38. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, I also like Bethany Frankel's story career wise because she talks about a lot how she was in New York City. She was broke until she was 38. She was like, I was a late bloomer. My businesses weren't thriving. So I love when women are honest about about the journey and the trajectory and like when things happen because it's not that relatable to be a child star. My husband um, went to school with Rachel Brosnahan and mm-hmm. she's amazing and she's so talented. But they were all, all, they were like, yeah, she came into school. She'd already shot like three movies. You know what I mean? Right. It's like, yeah. that's, that's one person's kind of timeline and it's not super relatable to the vast majority. Yeah. Well, I think that's what's so important. It's like us, not us necessarily us, obviously we're having it in this space, but like us as in like the generational us talking about mm-hmm. these things more openly um, and debunking this idea of these quote unquote expectations you know, and that it really is this self agreed upon like morphing that like you either choose to accept or like want to continue going with or you one day say like, no, I want to try and do something else. Like I think there really is a lot of self onus to like, no, I get to choose what I want to do today and then tomorrow, right. and then the next day. And granted, yeah, you can like plan and look beyond and visualize and envision and goals, whatever it is that works for you in that type of like, you know, planning land. But no one's there to say that that is wrong or right except for yourself. And even that is subjective. Right. right. And we all should be able to change our minds whenever yeah. we want. And so I'm interested. So we all kind of introduced ourselves earlier about, you know, what we're up to right now. I'm interested if you guys ever get anxiety about like, well, what if I let one go? Or what if I stop doing one? What will people think? Like, what if I stop being a makeup artist? Or what if I don't want to sing right now? Or what if I, like, do you guys get that? And I I do. And I have to be like, Alex, chill. It's your life. You're allowed to do or not do what you want. Yeah. I mean, I definitely had that anxiety for the first five years of my 30s. (laughs) I turned 35 in November and suddenly something clicked and I'm not going to say it won't click back Mm -hmm. but I'm suddenly like wait I get to decide I get to decide I have autonomy over my choices and I I had a lot of anxiety about being single you know I've been single for a long time I don't have kids um and I was really stressed about it and I spent a whole lot of time last year dating and trying to figure out like what was wrong with me and turns out I just really enjoy my company and yeah. I don't really need anyone else's company right now. And if someone comes along, great, but I, it's not something I want to expend my energy searching for because it doesn't feel like something that's missing. So when I turned 35, I sort of felt a little bit more secure than I had felt in 
a long time about those things. But there is definitely that fear that creeps in of like, I'm never going to do another cruise ship contract. Mm. I'm never going to go and leave for six months and do a show. Or maybe I will. I don't know. I Yes, there is anxiety because it's like, oh, I'm too old to do this. It's like, but am I? Yeah. We get to decide, right? Yeah. Oof. I went more through like an anxiety of like letting people down. So like right before the pandemic, I was producing a lot of like photo oh. shoots and things like that. I was putting some concerts together. I produced this whole exhibit that a uh, photo exhibit that benefited the Times Up Legal Defense Fund. And it was yes. just so successful. It was and I loved it. And then the pandemic hit. And what I learned is I was not put on this earth to deal with COVID guidelines and hire a COVID officer. And that's like 80% of being on a set or, and it's just not for me. And I decided I wanted all of the things I love about producing to go into the podcast. Mm. But I had this fear of like, oh my God, will people think I'm just like giving up or not finishing what I started or just, I had a fear of like what other people would think about that. Mm. And, and then had to rein myself back in and say, you don't have to explain a damn thing. Yeah. You made a turn. You reroute it. When I came over this evening, um, Alex and her husband, Vinny, were talking and Alex and I were both commiserating over, we were having a lot of anxiety about stuff. And she goes, I, I was having anxiety because I, I thought, am I, am I going to my chiropractor too much? Do you think he's upset with me for going too much? And her husband yeah. was like, he's mad because we're giving him business. Yeah, like, you know? <laughs> I do. So the source of my, if I have anxiety, if I like can't, it will be because I accidentally let someone down like mm. five years ago. Yeah. Like that is where my anxiety lies. Yeah. Like I hurt someone's feelings or I let them down. Like yeah. that is where most of my anxiety stems from. And yeah. it's always my work in therapy and in life to just be like, <sighs> chill out. And even if you did, you didn't mean it. So like take a breath. <laughs> yeah. I think about I, I mean, I'm, I don't always practice what I preach, but I'd actually say that I'm fairly decent at, for the most part, not quote unquote caring about other people. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, that's actually, let me rephrase that. I care a lot about it. other people, <laughs> <laughs> or at least the people I care about, but their opinions of me, I genuinely don't care as much about because, and maybe again, a lot of therapy, I... I've gone on a long journey in my life about self-acceptance, you know, kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier of like, you know, taking up space. I take up space. I always have. I have a lot of opinions. I am a strong person with beliefs that I'm not afraid to share. Something about me walks into a room and people notice. And I used to apologize for it and I was told to shrink for it. And in grad school specifically, it was a time where I – really had to own it. And I had to make decisions about who I was and who I am and who I want to be and the way in which people receive me. And I I equate it career-wise to like, you know, the Mark, Martin Scorsese's of the world always work with Leonardo DiCaprio. You know, like there's, it's not like nobody else could, sure, nobody else can do what Leonardo DiCaprio does, but like there's a reason because they really have an incredible rapport that they love working together, you know? And I, I really do believe that like if I show up like myself and fully like myself, then I will hopefully be attracting those people who also vibe with that energy and I'm meeting those people who I vibe with simultaneously. With that said, perhaps my circle stays a little smaller because I'm not trying to appease everyone and make everyone like me. Um, you know, again, I say that it's not easy, um, but it's also like, no one actually cares about anybody other than themselves. And maybe that's like a very bold statement to say, but we all only care about ourselves. We are animals. Like when push comes to shove, mm -hmm. it is survival of the fittest. And like you need to like do your own shit to make sure that like you can survive your day and do it well. And so mm -hmm. no one's really, really paying attention to all the stuff that you're doing because they're so preoccupied with themselves. And for me, that has been such a release where it's like, if I think if I think about my day and how like <laughs> focused and lasered focused on on the stuff that I'm needing to do, I don't even have time to think about what anybody else is doing. And I imagine no. it's the same thing for somebody else. So like, I guess this is my offering to you, <laughs> Alex. Is like, I know it's like easier said than done, but like, no one cares. It is, and 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 it's like that is kind of my 
lifetime practice. Yep. Like I always just have to, I constantly practice bringing myself back to that. Correct. Because I know no one cares. Yeah. Sometimes my body doesn't. You well, know what yeah, I mean? No, I and so I always have to bring myself back to that. And I think in this career, when you're dealing with so many different personality types and you never yeah. know kind of like what's coming at you, to just take a minute and not, you know, make sure that you don't like morph to what yeah. all of the other people coming at you need, mm -hmm. you know, is a thing to be aware of. Because we we don't have jobs where we work with the same team every week, all right? day. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, I understand he's like this, she's like this. I mean, it's constantly new, new people, new energy coming at you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What you were saying about people don't think about you as much as you think about yourself. I mean, my dad used to say that all the time growing up, mm -hmm. you know, 90 5% of the time you're thinking about yourself. You're not thinking about the other people. And yet he would also always say, you always need to think about the other person. Do unto others as you would have them yeah. do unto you. you I always think. And so it was very like kind of conflicting information mm. growing up. Um, I had this realization in the tub the other night. I was meditating. and It's where all good um, information happens. I'm telling you. In the right? bathtub, in the shower. Yes. And I was mm -hmm. thinking like, you know, why I am the way I am when it comes to dating or relationships. And I... I know all of the proper, like gentlemanly things to do. Mm -hmm. Like I'm the first to open someone's door. I would like to pay their tab. I would like to walk on the outside of the street. I know every, everything's my dad taught me those things. And I was like, oh my God, I was raised to be a gentleman, mm. not and expected to be a lady. Interesting. And I realized that. And I was like, I wonder how, if there are other people out there that have something similar. Of, my dad raised me. He was like, you need to be a lady but he raised me to be a gentleman. Well, we taught, we had someone on the podcast who was really explaining the difference between masculine and feminine energy and more in energy, not in like physically presenting, but in energy and mm -hmm. how we all kind of need a perfect mix of them. And she was kind of telling us that we can both be really a lot in our masculine mm -hmm. in, in different ways. And the feminine is more relaxing, receiving, attracting, mm. letting things come to you. And the masculine is like, I'm going to make this shit happen. Which like, if you're, you moved to New York city and do it, we, we all have, like, we're have all that personality that, right? type, you know? Yeah. So I, for me, I like, I, I'm, I want to push back on that so badly. Like I know it's, it's the way we've been taught and it's the way the society is built that there are these masculine, feminine energy, whatever expectations. Like, like we've been taught that it is the way that it is. But like my inner gut is like wanting so badly to push against that. Just I think because it's like – yeah that is what's setting us up for these boxes and making us feel like there are these expectations. Going back to right. what we are talking about, like those things – are what's setting us up for quote unquote failure in that like we're not feeling like we are empowered to just exist and be the way we need to be, which may be more quote unquote masculine, which may be more quote unquote feminine. But really when push comes to shove, it's like all of that is you. Right. So the thing that made it click for me is that it's like if someone only trained the right side of their body okay. and not their left. Yeah. It, it less about who you are and more about balance. Okay. Like if you're the push, 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 push kind of gal, take a day where you don't make a plan and let yourself chill. Like more about the balance. So, yeah. or if you're chilling a lot and you're always like the universe will, will <laughs> bring it to me. Maybe you need to set yourself a little to-do list girl and like write right. it down and like take some action. That's what kind of made it click for me is it's more of like a balancing and less of like having to do a certain thing. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. It kind of reminds me, and this is totally different, but not where on an episode we had with Heidi Marshall, she talks about when she's working with actors and like they're doing a self tape, how usually we come in with an idea that we want to do it a certain way. And she was always like, okay, let's completely flip it. And a <laughs> lot of artists are like, no, it's a, I'm supposed to be the villain. And she's like, cool. What if the villain was chill as fuck? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. And then what are you going to learn and discover while you're doing the total opposite? And I think that for me, what you just said, Alex, makes a lot, it, it clicks in that like giving yourself both or like offering from the space that maybe isn't your natural go-to will automatically yes. kind of like integrate a little bit more from perhaps the side you are more used to into like a whole Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. That's exactly how I've been understanding. I it. do still think that there is like an overall like societal expectation 
to check off the boxes though. Mm -hmm. Even if you figured it all out, even if you've got your balance, even if you've it's still, but are you married? Well, oh, right. you're married. Do you have kids? Oh, you have right. kids. Okay. So uh, when are you retiring and going on a trip? And okay. What, it's like, yeah. you have to do these certain things. And it's like, I am nowhere near any of that. And yeah. people are like really bought, they're really baffled by, by that. Is it because you're, as in you're nowhere near that because you've chosen to embrace what is, or are you nowhere yes. near that because- that's actually not what you're wanting. Both. Yeah. Both. I think I don't know what I want. And I think I've never wanted to, I, I didn't want to settle with what I was faced with. You mm -hmm. know, I didn't like where I was. So I wanted to move and find something better and bigger. And I think there's always something better and bigger. Um, and like settling down and, and doing the, the, that norm, like, I don't, I don't want to say normal, that expected trajectory yeah. it was just not it's doesn't it never felt right to me mm. to me you're very career focused like i my perception of you tina is like you do know what you want you want this flourishing career you want to be a makeup artist but also go on tour and also have your solo show and also fly off and do theater you know what i mean yeah. that like that's more of your priority and then you're like look if i meet someone i meet someone mm -hmm. that is exactly how i wish to run my life and i talk about it in therapy all the time. I feel like I am expected to have all of that and be that. And then also have, you know, like a baby on my hip and mm -hmm. a loving husband and a mansion and, you know, have that life as well. I'm like, I'm not as worthy mm -hmm. because I don't have those things. There was this awesome episode of Glennon Doyle's podcast that is like, I mean, I never miss a week and, you know, but with Tracy Ellis Ditto. Ross. I just listened to it. Yeah. Yeah. That one, I, that's the one that like, listen to this episode and then go listen to the one with Tracy Ellis Ross is like a secondary. So I have to good. listen because I love Glennon Doyle and I love Yeah. Tracy she, Ellis but Ross. she talks yeah. about, and she's so candid and open about the fact that she's, I guess she just had her, is it her 50th? Was it her 50th? Right? Yes. Yeah, I believe it was her 50th. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Her 50th birthday and how she's single and how most of her friends are not. And the way in which she owns that identity is profoundly unbelievable. She there was not an ounce of shame. Not there was at not, all. You, there was not shame anywhere in Nowhere. a 10 mile radius of, yeah. of her speaking about it. It was so unbelievable. Cool. Yeah. I loved, I just, it, it, you, you said it perfectly. Yeah. The shame. It was none of yeah. that. None. I, I never heard a person specifically of her caliber from her whole life, obviously, but like of her caliber standing in true vulnerability and honesty about where she is in her life with zero apologies. Yeah. Oh, it was, yes. Uh, yes. I was going to bring her up at some point yeah. during this podcast of just how it's like, I just, I love, I love exactly how she spoke about yeah. that. Oh, so good. I mean, I don't know, Alex, with you and your life, how are you feeling in terms of where you're at? So uh, Tina and I love therapy, if you can't tell me. So, Clearly same. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's great. So what I, I mean, I've come really far, but I would say like a few months ago, what I was working out with my therapist is I had this idea that I should get all of my career goals done before <laughs> I have a baby, yeah. like accomplish. And no one ever told me this. I have the best example. My mother she always works. She's in our business. She started a new business in her fifties. Yes. She always worked after she had us. She's constantly evolving. So like no one ever told me this my whole life and no one ever showed it to me, but it's somewhere in me that I thought, okay, I need to accomplish everything I want before I have a baby. <laughs> my therapist is like, Alex, hopefully when you feel that you have accomplished everything you want, you will be close to death. <laughs> like hopefully. So like, let's just throw that and she's like, talk about control. You can't yeah. control when you get pregnant and you can't control what the hell happens in this insane career you've chosen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So right now I have been, and I'm feeling in a good spot right now of just throwing all the timelines, all the good. stuff out the window because, and again, though, it, it's not like you wrap it up in a bow. It's a day and you're done. It's a daily practice yeah. of like, goals and kids are going to happen yeah. when they are meant to happen. Mm -hmm. And there's no control there. So. Oh, yes. Look at you. Yeah. I mean, so we'll see. How about you? Yes. Are you putting limit, you know, are you working on any sort of like limitations or breaking down limitations you put on yourself? Oh, 
yes. And I feel I was talking to my therapist. <laughs> Everyone needs a good therapist, y'all. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Truly. I was talking to my therapist about how nothing in my life Truly, not a single thing in my life looks like what I thought my life would look like. Not a single thing, um, for better or for worse. And how also simultaneously there's so much for me to be grateful for and to have gratitude for while also being really sad about the things that I wish were different. And I don't give myself, you know, resolutions or – expectations for uh, New Year's, but I, I give myself like a word and a lot of – my word has been patience <laughs> and also um, being really present. And I think by incorporating those two things more into my life, hopefully I will continue to uh, attract and um, open myself up to the things that I really want I think I've readjusted my idea of the way in which it will come. Um, I think that's really the biggest thing. It's like I thought it would happen by a certain time in a certain way. And the timeline is gone. So that I, 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 that part no longer w worries me as much because it just hasn't happened. So what, what the fuck is a timeline anyway? But how can I allow for these things that I really want to come to me in ways that I didn't expect and or control the ways that I want them to come for, to me if I have that control capability. Um, but it's been it's been hard. I think in your thir when one reaches their thirties, no one talks about your thirties, and so I no. you, you hear all about your twenties and you hear all about your forties and beyond. This thirty decade, in some ways, feels really exciting. I love being in my thirties so far, but it feels really exciting because they're really. I don't know the the besides the like you will not have the things by your time you're 30. That's already out the window. So now that I'm here, it can be literally anything because no one has mm -hmm. like told me what the 30 should be for the for better. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. you're still allowed to want all the things you want. Absolutely. Mhm. Mm Absolutely. You know, and I think we feel bad about it. It's just, there's no ending. I mean, we should still be wanting things when we're 60. Hopefully we all oh, should yeah. still have goals. And yep. we should yes. Still. So yeah, it's just breaking down these old, these really old ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And being open, I think, to the, the way in which things can come to you, you know, whether that's flexibility or whether that's just, you know, a bit more of like an openness generally. I think being open, willing, able to receive um, is a wonderful shift to be made so that any of these things can come through and then you get to choose whether you want to, to incorporate them in your life or not. I, I'm going to bring up Glennon Doyle again. And I know right. I've said this to you, Alex, but she, on one of her episodes, was talking about being a seeker. Yeah. And she said, I never – I." I never want to be done seeking Yeah, because if she, I, I think it was about, it was the episode that they um, were talking about cults. Yep. <laughs> and she was like, if you, if someone's like, oh, I have the, I have the answer. I found the answer. I know the answer to life run. That's a cult Yeah, because you sh that life isn't like that. There are no answers. Yeah. Everything is fluid and changing, constantly changing. And she said, I want to be a seeker in this world because that means I'm constantly changing and evolving and learning. Yeah. I resonated. Mm -hmm. Right. I have to catch up on Glennon Doyle's <laughs> podcast, gals. Oh my gosh. I'm right there with Tina you, Tina. I, <laughs> I yeah, love it. Yeah, really. We're also very sensitive to and also fascinated by and terrified of cults. We had a Nexium survivor on our podcast and we also sadly have both, were both sent to Landmark years ago, which was terrifying. So mm -hmm. we're really oh sensitive God. to the, to when someone <laughs> says, I know everything. Wait, you, you both to went to me. Landmark? Yes. Yeah, accidentally. Please tell me there's just... a podcast episode that I haven't listened to that talks about this. <laughs> I think we I... talk about maybe I'll said I think it, it's earlier because we had so we had India Oxenberg on our podcast. Mm -hmm. She was a Nexium survivor. She was amazing. But yeah, and we had a whole 
talk about about cults, but we're really, I mean, so no, when but have you talked says, about it? I want to know about your about about landmark. Yeah, yes. we did a okay. brief yes. landmark, but I feel like we should revisit it because I, I have a, like people get ask a lot of questions oh, about it. God. Yeah. But it's, I mean, it's terrifying. I do not have good memories mm-hmm. about it at all. Good. It basically teaches you not to trust your gut, not to, not to trust trust your it's instincts. It's so which, like Nexium. It's so Nexium. Which as women, we have such strong oh, and yeah. good instincts, yes. and we should be listening mm-hmm. and like honing those in. And something we talked about with India is India said, you know, Nexium taught me not to trust my instincts so that when I was scared, I didn't know if I'm scared, like nervous, like, oh, cause it's a job interview. Mm-hmm. Or I'm like, oh, there's a predator in the room. Yeah. It's like, oh, when we right. listen, we learn to like differentiate between. But anyway, when someone says to Tina or I, God, I just don't know. I'm still figuring that out. We like immediately trust them. Oh yeah. We're like, oh, that's great. <laughs> like, Come sit God. with us. Yes. Yes. Let's not that's the barometer. Together. Yeah. The We're barometer is like, you know nothing. So do I. Come sit Come at my table. Over here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I love it. I yeah. love it when people don't that know things. That would be, that would be my table as well. I'd be like, yeah, I know. The more I know, the more I know absolutely nothing. Truly. Like, right. That is right. True. If there's anything I know, it's that I know nothing. And if there's anything I know is that I will know even less tomorrow and the day that until the day right. I die. Truly. Yeah, yep. next week. Yeah. Yeah. Literally that. Um, as we like wind down our time, I'm I, I know here on our pod, and I imagine your pod too, we're all about like a a tool, a trick, a resource, a takeaway. Is there anything that's on your heart that you want to throw into the space, whether it's like about expectations or about something that you've started? incorporating into your lives as like a practice or something that's made, you know, feeling okay with the not okay a little bit better? Is there something that maybe is like on your hearts? Yeah. I want to throw out a few resources. First of all, if you have it, this came out a few years ago, Michelle Obama's book called Becoming. It's literally the whole theme of the book about how you're always becoming yourself every day. You're still becoming yourself. You're never done. Like you're never like fully cooked. Um, also the Melissa Wood health app and it's 9.99 a month there's a lot of meditation it's not just workout it's meditations and just her whole story is inspiring and then the podcast by a friend of mine Annalisa Lemming called yeah, a balancing an act. act we had Annalisa yeah. on our last season you did I missed that yeah. somehow I have to go back and listen yeah. so she especially if there's moms she is a mom her little guy I think he's like two-ish his name is Gabe and she's pregnant with her second right now and she's a creative type and just really you know gets in and dives deep with her conversations so definitely yeah. check that out. And you can also go back and listen to our episode with her. Yes, yes. for sure. I have to. <laughs> what, um, about, what about you, Tina? Okay, combination of Lauren Everett's technique and um, my friend Maggie Hollenbeck, who um, she is a therapist and she's on Instagram uh, and she's wonderful and she posts wonderful like meditations and things. Um, I did a, a gratitude practice with her a few years ago. And then Lauren also kind of does it in her like daily layout of have you seen this it's like a journal that you do and i i've been doing this journal since the pandemic where you write out your day and you write out you know what book am i going to read today the podcast i'm going to listen to the music i'm going to listen to um and then you write out what you're grateful for who you're sending happiness to and how you want to feel that day and then below that you write your to-do list and you've got you know so it's a whole kind of journal page and i have found it to be so helpful and when i did this gratitude workshop with maggie a few years ago it was i i learned how to be more grateful and that you can be grateful for the things that you think that you're unhappy with you know i'm grateful that i feel this pain in my shoulder because it's my body telling me that i need to go take care of it in this way whatever um but but by starting each like each morning by just writing three things that I'm grateful for, whether it's the coffee in my cup or um, the time that I have, you know, right now when I'm not working as much, it it really does help put things in perspective yeah. for me. When I feel like I'm not doing enough, yeah. when I feel like I'm not where I want to be in my life, I go, oh my gosh, well, could you have written this gratitude journal entry five years ago? Absolutely not. Yeah. You would have gone, I wish I had more time. I wish I had a hot coffee in my lap, but I'm, you know, dragging my ass to some horrible job in Midtown. Yeah. You know, I wish I had this. I wish I had this. And now I'm like, oh, wow, I, I have all these things that I've wished for. And I think that reflection is really helpful. I mean, because you always, your younger self would be so impressed with what you're doing now, but you oh, lose sight of it. So yeah. that's a really good way to actually make yourself remember. And lo- I mean, Tina, I, 
our little kid selves would be like, what? You guys are so cool. Like you're living in our city and you, you're only doing creative yeah, jobs. Like what? But yeah. the day you get really lost in the day to day of, you know, I'm not doing enough and the things and all that. So that's, I, that sounds really cool, Tina. I didn't know you're doing that. I also, oh. I mean, to tag onto that, I've been doing the five minute journal for the past two years. It's the same type of thing. It's one page. Um, there's a morning half and a night half. And they're the same questions every day. It's even shorter. It takes you literally a minute if you act, unless you're having Love a really that. hard day. But there's the three things that you're grateful for. Um, what would make today great? And one daily affirmation. And then at the evening, it's like, what were three things that were awesome? And what did you learn today? Or like, what's something that you want to take away from today? That's it. And I've been doing that it. for two years. And same type of thing where it's just – you know, to come to yourself, especially when it's hard and to have to find something that's really hard to be like, what am I grateful for? And you just yeah. get, go small. Um, my dog will always be on that list. You know, it's like, no, or I have a roof over my head and clean water, you know, like really mm-hmm. basic if it's tough. But to come to that practice really does on a micro level do some inner shifting um, yeah. molecularly that, you know, I'm not a scientist clearly, but it has to no i it it does and it, it so we're all you know part of this giant universe and i really do think like putting that energy out in the world it, it's good it's good juju yeah you, you know, know and i was listening to a scientist talk about this though and to your point of like we're hardwired to think about ourselves in survival we're hardwired to wake up in the morning and think what can hurt me what's dangerous Correct. like is there a bear attack is there some you know but we're in a day and age where like if you're lucky we're gonna wake up and like uh, we're gonna have coffee like we're not in immediate danger so we have to rewire our brains to not look for it you yeah. know <laughs> like yeah. in this day and age yeah. so it's so hard <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I adore you both so much. I'm this was so you. fun. This we were so great. looking forward to it. Same. We love your podcast. Same. We're so proud of everything you're doing. Same. I gotta say, I was I told Alex I was really cranky. I think I'm PMSing. Um, and I was just had a cranky afternoon and I feel so much lighter and better. And I might not even have to take my Xanax when I get home. Yay! Oh my god, <laughs> little wins. This was little great. wins. You can save a pill, save it for a rainy day. I know. Yes. <laughs> I'm so I'm great. so grateful to you both. I think your podcast is such an incredible resource and empowering. Um, I love that we get to now share our people in this way because your people are my people and my people are your people. Um, yes. So that just warms my heart. Me too. Ditto. This was the best. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. For anybody who's listening, uh, what is the best way for people to reach out within y'all's boundaries? So we're on Instagram at obsessed with the best pod. Same on TikTok. Our Instagram, our link tree is all of our links. And we are obsessed with the best with Alex and Tina. We are on Apple and Spotify and a new episode every Wednesday. Yes. And on my end, you can find Empowered Artist Collective at Empowered Artist Collective on Instagram. We also have our little, you know, what's it called? A hamburger that comes down for all the little things that you can click on. Um, we are streaming across all the platforms. You can find more on our website at empoweredartistcollective.com. And we are on TikTok, which um, is a slow burn, but at Empower Artist Collective as well. Great. All right. Love Perfect. it. Perfect. Amaze. Thank you. Thank this you. was so fun. Yay. Yay.